And so now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Stephen Moser. <laughs>
spending several days in a row lying in bed. <laughs> you got a lot of time to think about what you come from and where you're going, who you are, how you want to be. I'm going where the sun keeps shining through the pouring rain. Going where the weather suits my clothes. I'm making off of the northeast winds and sailing on the summer breeze. I'm skipping over the ocean like a sheets of paper and crayons, which became pencils, and then pens, and then um, typewriters, and then the paper went bye-bye because we had computers and cameras and just good old lip service to tell stories, because I believe stories are a really important part of our life. It is by sharing our stories that we see inside of each other, and by hearing our histories that we see inside of ourselves. And I've had a really, really good time being a storyteller, but... I never told stories with music before. And in January, I was talking to George Osborne, and we decided that this was my year to make a joyful noise. So since joy is the predominant emotion in my life these days, I have picked songs tonight that are only songs that make me happy. <laughs> there is no trick to a can-can. It is so simple to do. When you once get to a can can, it will be so easy for you. If a lady in Iran can, if a shady African can, if a chap with a slap of a fan can, you can, can, can too. If an English dapper dan can, if an Irish can, a hand can. If we can, if we tan, courtesan can, baby, you can, can, can too. If in Dobeel, every swell can, it is so easy to do. If Debussy and Ravel can, it will be so easy for you. If the Louvre, Christian can, if the Guard, Republican can, if Van Gogh and Matisse and Cezanne can, Can can if in Lesbos a pure Lesbian can The first time that I heard the song Can Can was 1985, and I was immediately drawn to the bounce and the pep and the melody, and then I said, the song is racy. You know? <laughs> now, I don't know if the song was as racy or less racy in 1953 when it was written, because people weren't really being politically correct then. And you could just say things like, if a chap with a slap of a fan, in 1953. But in 1985, that was racy. 
and today it's just racist. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know me, <laughs> and some of you know me, <laughs> you know that I love racy and I love racist. And I don't mean, no, 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 no. I'm not talking sheet wearing, people hating racism. I mean the racism that gives people of a so called minority an opportunity to use their life experience to share their story with their audience through their art. Right? If you've ever seen the stand up comedy of, I'm not going to name names, but there's this little diminutive man, and then there's that Asian bisexual girl, you guys know her. Um, if you've ever seen a, a film made by a black filmmaker, or, or heard a song by a feminist songwriter, or read a gay author's novel, then you know what I'm talking about. They are using their life experience to inform, to share their truth, and truth is so, so important. My truth is that I have a race car. My husband says I play it too much. <laughs> but they also say you have to play the hand you're dealt. Now, if, 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 if I brought my hand away from the vest, you see that I have a gay card. I have a bald card, now you know. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a reformed alcoholic par card. The, the parenthetical is beautiful, the reformed alcoholic card. Um, I have a short card. I used to be 5'8", now I'm 5'7". I... <laughs> anyway, the card that I have been living with and dealing with the longest is my race card, because I was born one quarter Filipino. And, you know, I was just a child the first time somebody called me a gook. And trust me when I tell you I've been called every name in the book. So, I thought that as I got older, and the world got older, and we got wiser together, that maybe things would change. And they changed. Not enough, but they've changed. I mean, has anybody here read a profile on a gay hookup app? <laughs> no fats, no femmes, no blacks, no Asians. And we always get last billing, and I want to know if it's because... <laughs> <laughs> We're an afterthought, or because we get special billing, like, and starring Miss Barbara Stanwyck as Victoria Barker. <laughs> I'll tell you a story really quickly. I was on a, when I was on a dance floor a few years back. Uh, they call them clubs now. We used to call them discos. Um, and a young, young man walked on to me. And we danced together for like 20 or 30 minutes before he says to me, what are you? <laughs> now, I get this a lot because this can be a little ambiguous. And he says, what are you? And I said, Pacific Islander. And he said, you know, I'm usually not into Asians, but you're hot, so it's okay. And uh, I put my hands on his shoulders and I removed his body from my body and I said, thank you for making me the exception to your racism. And then I found a new dance partner. You know? So, is, I'm only a quarter Filipino, and I gotta deal with stuff. And I thought about, I find myself thinking what it was like for my grandfather as an immigrant in the first part of the last century, or my mother, who is a Filipino, going to Hollywood High in the 50s. Now, I've asked my mother about this. I've asked her about this. My mother is a tough, 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 tough lady. I may have inherited some of this from her. <laughs> and she told, you know, she told me that if she had trouble in high school, she could take care of it. But in spite of that, she got herself into a gang. Now, I don't want you to get, I don't want you to, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Think, you know, Greece. Think Betty Rizzo without the promiscuity, okay? So my mother got herself into a gang because they would protect her even though she didn't need the protection. That was one half of her race card. The other half, because my mother has great duality about her, and I may have got some of that too. Um, my mother was not just tough, she was glamorous. She was a big glamour puss because her mother designed and made all of her clothing. So mama was always in couture. And at the age of 15, my mother's mother would get both of them dolled up and they would hit the hot spots around Beverly Hills and Hollywood. Uh, you know what it was like in the 50s? when unescorted ladies would go up to the door of an establishment, there would be a condescending man at the door that says, we do not allow unescorted ladies into this establishment. Well, my grandmother was Scots-Irish and a little Cherokee, so she's there all dressed up with her fair skin and freckles and blue eyes and red hair. And here is 
the Filipina Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> right next to her. And she'd say, do you know who this is? This is Hawaii's Princess Nelly Kalini Lana. <laughs> Do you really want to start an incident between the states? <laughs> they got in. <laughs> Every single time. So my mother was smart. She learned how to use what she was given to her advantage. Mama has told me several times in my life that she only ever did exactly what she wanted. I may have inherited some of that <laughs> to me. It's your life. You have to do what you want in life. One has to face a huge assortment of nauseating fads and good advice. There's health and fitness, diet and deportment, and other pointless forms of sacrifice. Conversation, wit, I am a doubter. Manners and charms are no way to impress. So forget the inner me. Observe the outer. I am what I wear and how I dress. <laughs> Looking like my time on earth is cooking, whether polka dotted, striped, or even checked with some glamour guaranteeing every fiber of my being is displayed to quite this remarkable effect. From your cradle by a true soul to your deathbed, you're on view, so never compromise, accept no substitute. I would rather wear a barrel than conservative apparel Cause dress has always been my strongest suit My grandmother worked at Paramount Studios When I was a kid, she would open up her wallet Pull out her Paramount Pictures ID card and show it to me And I was in heaven because I was into old movies and old Hollywood And I thought that was the coolest thing In her dresser, she had this drawer full of mementos from the studio days. There were big patches of black sequin fabric, and I would pull them out and look at them and find that some of the sequins had been melted. And I said, what is this about? And she told me this was once a dress worn by Ginger Rogers, but somebody in the studio put an iron on top of it. And Edith had wanted to throw it away, so Grandma said, no, 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 those are good sequins. I'm taking that home. <laughs> and so she cut it up and set it aside because she was sure she would use those sequins. She never did. She gave them to me, and I picked them off the material, and I sewed them on a costume that I wore in a play in high school. And then I sewed more onto a costume that I wore in a play in college. And then two years later, in a play in college, I'm doing a lot of musicals. <laughs> in the drawer, there was this big roll of papers. She would take them out and put them on the dining table and unfurl them, and I would see costume sketches that she had done. And she'd say, this is Joan Crawford, and this is Jean Tierney. And that's the right thing. And she had an envelope full of big black and white 8x10 negatives that we'd hold up to the light. And they were archival photos of costume sketches from the movies. And she'd tell me which movie and which star was represented in each negative. My grandmother told me stories about Edith Head's workroom where they made the costumes and the bungalow where they fitted the costumes. Now, at the bungalow, if a star or a starlet arrived early for a fitting, she'd let them in if they had behaved like a star in previous fittings. And if they hadn't, she made them wait outside. And if you were outside and people passed by and saw you, they knew that you'd been busted by Edith Head. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know, don't you? You want to know, don't you? Okay, Barbara Stanley. Yeah. Elizabeth Tate. Oh. Lana Turner. My mother's babysitter. Always got in early. The girl standing outside, Elizabeth Scott, Veronica Lake. My grandmother would show me pictures by Terrell of Dietrich and Garbo and say, look at the way the light catches in the folds of her hair and yet extends the eyelashes by the shine. Look at the way she stands, matches the line of her dress. 
and the way she drags the fur on the floor. These talks with Marjorie, they're what gave me an appreciation for beauty and glamour. They're what made me want to be an artist and a photographer. These talks with my grandmother are what made me gay. <laughs> I ensure that every stitch is stitched to the time. Whether wig or hat or turban, whether clad boudoir or urban, not just shrug your stuff outrageously is such a crime. And if you are invited to my wardrobe, I'm delighted as they wander through my things and find on route. It was a movie with Hedy Lamarr, Victor Mature, and the great Angela Lansbury, right? So, there was this peacock cake, very famous, in the movie. Tip to tail, nothing but peacock feathers. Grandmother told me to make this cake, they had to straight pin the peacock eye to the material and clip the tail all the way down. And then all the stitchers would stand around this enormous table and they would glue the peacock eye in place remove the straight pin and dispose of it. Except there was this one woman who had a very particular way of doing this job. She would glue the peacock eye, remove the straight pin, and insert it. And she would glue the peacock eye and remove the straight pin and insert it. And she kept doing this until eventually none of the other women were working. <laughs> they were just standing there watching her, watching this appalling and horrifying sight, thinking, what the hell is going on over there? So my grandmother says, she went to Edith and she said, could you come out here? And Edith Head came out and she said, nobody's working. And my grandmother said, watch. And Edith Head stood there and watched. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get her off of this job. Take her off the station and move her to Buttons and Bows. And so the woman was moved from the cave to Buttons and Bows. And she said, okay. And she left the cave and she walked to the side table and she began pulling out straight pins, dropping them into the table. And before she left, she reached inside her blouse, inside her bra, and pulled out two of Joan Crawford's children pads. something like this. <laughs> Zip. Walter Lippmann wasn't brilliant today. Zip. Will Saroya ever write a great play? Zip. I was reading Schopenhauer last night. Zip. And I think that Schopenhauer was right. I don't want to see Zarina, I don't want to meet Kavita Zip. I'm an intellectual, I don't like to meet Kavita Zip, or I'm his voice is out of Zip. I'm a heterosexual Zip. <laughs> I'm an intellect to master my art. Zip, the hell is Margie Hart? My grandfather also worked in Hollywood, but not for the studio. He worked for Mae West. Wow. Wow. Now here's the thing you don't know about Mae West. She loved children, but she didn't have children. 
So she got her maternal fix in by having my grandfather, her butler, her chauffeur, her cook, bring Snooky over every Thursday. Snooky was my mother. She was five, and she was named after a famous radio character, Baby Snooks. Baby Snooks. Okay, so on Thursdays, they would doll mommy up, and she would go over with Grandpa to Mae West's house where she would sit on a stool in the kitchen while he worked. Because Mae West had to sleep in, wake up, freshen up, and I mean the full mermaid, the hair, the, the whole, in the bed, with the frills and the frippery and the covers pulled up to here, and she'd call the kitchen around noon. And she'd say, Ben, you can send Snooky in. And so Mom would go down the hall to Mae West's room, and she'd knock on the door. And Mae West would say, come on in, Snooky. And Mom would open the door, and there's Mae West sitting in a round bed, <laughs> buried in a field of pillows, under the covers. And Mama would get up on top of the covers. And they would sit there. And they would chat. And eat hard candy out of a big cut crystal bowl. And they would look at each other and themselves in the mirror. <laughs> Round to match the bed. And then they would visit. Until after a while, Miss West would pull back the covers and get out of bed. And she'd walk across the room. And she'd take off her frippery pills and toss them aside. And underneath, Mae West was wearing a leotard and tights. And my mother watched her exercise for an hour. Mae West was hardcore about this. She had dumbbells and she did calisthenics. And she had, do you guys remember this thing? It's uh, two handles with coils in between it. And this is Mae West, not just on Thursdays, every day. Because Mae West knew who she was. She was the sex symbol of Hollywood. And Mae West knew what she needed to do to protect that. Mae West knew that she had to defy gravity. Zip! I consider Dottie's paintings passe. Zip! Can they make them metropolitan pay? Zip! English people don't say clerk, they say Clark. Zip! Anybody who says Clark is a jar. I have read the great Kabbalah and I simply worship on the zip. I am just a mystic. I don't care for whistling on the Charlie's hand to shoot with the zip. I'm a misogynistic zip. My intelligence is biting my hand. Zip, who the hell is Sally Wren? Mae West kept all of her jewelry in this little jewelry box. It was paste. She had the real stuff in the bank in the safety deposit room. When she had to go to a premiere, grandfather and the bodyguard would accompany her to the bank in the Rolls Royce. She would go into the bank, walk through the lobby with that funny little Mae West walk and go into the safety deposit room. And grandfather and the, the bodyguard would stand in the lobby and wait. Inside the safety deposit room, she would either switch or not switch the paste for the reel. And she did this so that nobody would rob her because nobody knew when she was carrying the paste for the reel. Now, on one occasion, she was in the bank room, the, the vault room, and the two men were in the lobby and they had a new teller on you who didn't know what was going on. And he saw a gun in the bodyguard's belt. And he sounded the alarm. And the police came. And they don't care what cockamamie story you tell them. If there's a gun in a bank, you get taken downtown. So picture this. Mae West comes out of the vault. She's dressed up. She's got the jewelry box. She's got no chauffeur. She's got no body. She's like, where are my boys? No, really, where are my boys? The bank manager comes over and sheepishly, apologetically tells her what happened. She was cool. She was calm. She said, it's okay. I'm Mae West. She went to the tower. She withdrew some money to go down to the jail to bail him out. But she couldn't do that because Mae West didn't know how to drive. She didn't have a chauffeur because she was a movie star. She had a chauffeur because she didn't know how to drive. The only way to get Mae West to the premiere was to send a squad car back to the bank to chauffeur the movie star to the jail to bail out the chauffeur to take her to the premiere. Zip, jerk and slow shit does the trick for his hand. Zip, Melvin Monroe looks just dandy and mink. Zip, she not only acts, I hear she can think.
My grandfather, as a Filipino, was very superstitious. And Mae West was into the occult. She had this lover who had died. He was the love of her life, and she was continually having seances because she wanted to reach him in the afterlife. And one day, my grandmother came in, and she was having the umpteenth seance. Friends meet him, and he's, you know, and he quit on the spot. Every day for a week, and the rest called my grandmother. Marjorie, could you get Ben to come back to work? Marjorie, please ask Ben to come back to work. Every day for a week. Finally, after a week, grandmother said, honey, Ben, sweetie, he is never coming back into that house for ghosts. And with that, they left Hollywood. They bought a farm in Fresno. And there was an end to glamour and beauty and sophistication. All that remains is at my house, a bunch of rolled up old drawings, an envelope full of black and white negatives, and a little gay boy who grew up fabulous. <laughs> were there, 
with two strangers. And I was devastated. And I almost left the theater. I was heartbroken. And a voice in my head said, sit your ass down <laughs> and watch this movie. So I watched the movie, and about halfway through, I realized I was seeing my face on the biggest screen I had ever seen it on. And my husband's face. And my mother's face. And we were four blocks from Paramount Studios. <laughs> it was enough. And I watched that movie, and I left that theater, and I have never watched the movie again. Mm. Because I've had my ultimate experience with that film. And even though I have never watched the movie again, there is this song. Mm. I listen to it every single day. The very first time I ever heard it was during our first wedding in Marion County. And it was being sung by the woman who wrote it for us. Yeah. And it was the theme song in Marion County. Hi. Hey, baby. I love you. I love you. Cover me like water. Let me drown here in your embrace You could swim out to meet me Moonlight dripping from your face
they all who do this for a living didn't tell me this. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I was 15 years old and walking down 10th Avenue, as one does <laughs> in 1980 when one is 15. But my parents trusted me. We were here on vacation and uh, staying at the Dorset Hotel over on 54th, and I had read in After Dark magazine about this uh, record store in the village where I could buy all the cast albums and soundtracks I could fit into my suitcase to take back to Switzerland. <laughs> now, I got a map to map out the route because I don't want to ride the subway. That shit was scary, okay? It was 1980. So instead, I choose to walk straight across 54th to 10th Avenue, straight down 10th Avenue to the West Village to do my shopping. I was, to be fair, I was two weeks shy of 16. I was wearing Doc Siders without socks, which was a huge mistake for that walk. I was wearing tight, 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 tight white jeans, a royal blue terry cloth t-shirt. I had chestnut hair that waved and cast, 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 and down to here. I had a perpetual tan, cheekbones down to here, almond eyes, flared nostrils. I was almost unbearably pretty. I'm walking down 10th Avenue, and I'm not lying one little bit when I say that this happened somewhere in my current neighborhood. Between 54th Street and 45th Street, a man stopped me and said, you're a model. Oh. And I said, no, no, I'm not a model. He said, well, if you're not a model, you should be a model. And I am a photographer, and I have to take your picture. Now, I don't have a portfolio to show you because I'm just building my portfolio. But I really want to do your picture. And I said, OK. I can dig it. My family and I are in town for four days. We stay at the Hilton Hotel on 6th Avenue. The name on the reservation is Kavanaugh. My name is Chris. I wasn't stupid. I saw fame. I wasn't going to be Coco hanging my top off. <laughs> So, here's the kicker. I have thought of that man every day since. Because, first of all, what a nice compliment. Secondly, I really hope he wasn't her wits. <laughs> but finally, here's the real reason that I think of him. Every single time that I have ever went to a stranger and said, can I take your picture? I really hoped that they didn't think that I was a perv, and sometimes they did because they said no, but sometimes they didn't because they said yes, and sometimes they become your best friend and favorite boy singer songwriter, Amen Tracy. There are times when I wish the world was nothing but twilight And every morning And every evening Was the same old gorgeous change If only the night didn't sully the wonder of twilight But we are from dusk, and to dusk shall we always return The twilight is golden when you look from the dark But always moves on, making way for the dawn Fading to gray, will one will out away with nothing but twilight. Afraid that I may, I wish it were different and could find the strength. Help the man who will always 
see nothing but twilight Every moment just waiting for moments to come Always between Left in transition Not ahead or behind Changing his own Changing my mind oh, 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 <laughs> I wish the world were nothing but twilight And every day I wish I were different And content to stay the same Always between, always between, left in transition, left in transition, not ahead or behind, not ahead or behind, changing my mind. I sit back and watch with nothing to say. I'm stumbling backwards to the comfort of twilight. I'm wishing my life away and I can't wait till that changes Is it okay if I call you mine just for our time? And I will be just by my side if I know that you know that I'm wanting and needing. Your love. Oh, 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 If I ask of you, is it all right if I ask you to hold, hold, hold me tight through a cold, dark night? Cause there may be a cloudy day inside And I need to let you know that I, I might be needing your love Tony Qua
wonder like when I hear your name or see a place that you've been or see a picture of your grin or pass a house that you've been in one time or another. It sets off something in me that I can't explain. I can't wait to see you again. Oh, babe, I love your love. Oh, 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 Just the things that happen to me when I'm reminded of you. Who knew that song? Who knew that song? Yes. What's it from? Fame. Who saw the movie Fame when it came out? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. Did it fuck you up? <laughs> I mean, excuse my profanity, but really, that movie did a major number on me, okay? Uh, I was, I was, I think I was 15 or 16, I was a gay teenager with yeah. aspirations to go on the stage, to become a movie star, yeah. and I saw fame and I said, that's my life! Yes! That's just my life! I'm gonna go to New York, I'm gonna live in Alan Parker's dingy 70s mood life, I'm gonna be a bohemian revolutionary, I'm gonna study my craft, I'm gonna become rich and famous, and that shit never happened? And it really pissed me off for about 33 years. Excuse me, right here. 33 years, 33 years. I finally let go of the anger this year. This is me now. Okay, finally learned how to let go of the anger. But here's the thing. It didn't happen. Andy Warhol said that everybody gets 15 minutes of fame. I got nine. <laughs> I had three minutes for the sweater book. I had four minutes for married and counting. And two minutes for social media presence. <laughs> I am done. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you get to the point where I've gotten, you can really, it's so cliche, I can see clearly now. Uh, but when you can see things clearly, you can say, damn, that was fun. I had a really good time. You know, I didn't get the dream that I wanted when I was 16. I don't care. I had a really good time. I made some really good friends. I made some great art, and I brushed up against some really famous people. <laughs> Do you want to hear a story from the sweater book? Yeah. Yeah. I have prepared two, but I don't have time to share them both, so you guys get to decide who you hear about. I'll tell you who it is, and you can make some noise, okay? It's either Maggie Smith, yeah. or it's B. Arthur. Yeah. Maggie Smith, yeah. B. Arthur. By the time we got to work with Maggie Smith, uh, the sweater book had picked up momentum, and people were starting to know who I was and what the project was, and there were managers and press agents that would say, here's a list of my clients. And so I reached out to whomever repped Maggie Smith, and one day I got a fax that said, Maggie Smith said yes, and I said, <laughs> what? So we go to London to work with Maggie Smith. Now, for a week we were there, and everybody we spoke to was like, we're going to vote without Maggie Smith, and they couldn't have been less impressed. Like, really? If it had been Judy Dench? 
Okay. <laughs> Actors. Okay. And a lot of them said, she's going to be trouble. She's going to be trouble. She won't wear that sweater. It wasn't made for her. It's not brand new. It, she won't wear it. She's going to be trouble. And I was like, you know, kill Joy. So the day of the shoot, I wake up and I was like, we have a shoot with Maggie Smith in eight hours. We have a shoot with Maggie Smith in seven hours and 55 minutes. <laughs> All damn day, like the town crying. Okay? To make it worse, my nerves worse. We were seeing her in her show just before the shoot. So we're at the comedy theater watching her on stage be brilliant. And it's just her. It was the play Talking Heads. And it was just her. How do you be brilliant when it's just you all by yourself? You're Maggie Dan Smith. So <laughs> afterward, we're at the stage door. You know, I'm a nervous wreck. It's, it's autumn. It's freezing. I'm Maggie Smith. And they're making us wait, and they're making us wait. And to help calm me down, as if by providence, two queens walk by. And one of them says to you, I told you, darling, I could watch Maggie Smith sitting on the loo. And that made me laugh. And I was still laughing when the man said, Mr. Mosher, we're ready for you. And I said, OK. And so Pat and I went in. And if you've ever been backstage at a theater, you know the staircase. Teeny, tiny, tiny staircase going down. down. Teeny, tiny, skinny. You can't gotta walk single file. And as we're walking down, he's explaining that she's visiting with some friends and that um, she had to say goodbye. And we're patient. So I said to him, by the way, what should we call her? Because I rather think she likes Dame Maggie. I said, okay, Dame Maggie it is. So he takes us to the door of the dressing room. And it's a two room dressing room. None of that Lincoln Center bullshit where they put you in an ugly, nasty, you know. <laughs> it's a dressing room. The walls are painted a dusty rose color, and there's no overhead lighting. It's all lamps and mood lighting, and it's beautiful. And there's a settee in this room, and a settee in that room. And not a, a dressing, a vanity, a vanity with claw foot legs and three mirrors with telegrams and cards around. It was like being in a Judy Garland movie, okay? <laughs> She's saying goodbye to her friends. She brings them over and she introduces them to us. Well, nobody introduces anybody anymore. And then they left. I said, how do you do? How do you do? And uh, my modus operandi in those days was to let Pat show pictures from the book to the celebrity while I put up the lights. So, and she's his favorite actress. So it's giving him a chance to bond with Dame Maggie. So, they're going through the portfolio, and Pat knows Dame Maggie and her history, and he knows that one of the people in the sweater book is a bitter rival of hers. And no, I will not say the name. So as he turns the page, Pat says, and you know, and she says, oh yes, I do. <laughs> and then as we're turning the page, Pat says, and you know her, she says, oh, whoops. <laughs> well, where's Frank? And Pat said, oh, uh, we're having trouble getting him to be in the book. She was dating Frank Langella. And I said, I think he's being a bit shy. She said, I think he's being a bit of a movie star. And, she turned the page. <laughs> and then she sees this couple that were basically the La Fontaine of England. They were Dulcie Gray and Michael Dennison. And she says, oh, Gracie Dull. And Michael Dreary, son. And she turned the page. <laughs> She closes the portfolio. I handed her the sweater. <laughs> Put it on her slender, lithe body. And she says, I like to do this sitting in my dressing table. And she sits down. Now, the dressing table is here, and there's a chair right where Emmy is sitting. And Pat sat in that chair. And she sat here, and she talked to him, and she fixed her earring, and she fixed her hair, and she fixed her makeup, while I, like a fly on the wall, buzzed around taking pictures. Now, the photographer in me was very happy to be creating the art, but the person was like, Pat's jamming with Maggie Smith, Pat's jamming with Maggie Smith, and then we're done. I shot two rolls of film. I saved two frames, and I said to her, Dame Maggie, favor, may I take a picture of you with Pat? You are his favorite. Of course, come at me. And so he comes over, and he leans over like this, and she's here, and I take a picture of them in the mirror. Two frames, two pictures. She blinked in the first one, he blinked in the second one. <laughs> I gotta find somebody to marry the two pictures so they can match. Um, I packed up the lights, we put it all together. She, she, on the inside room, she takes off the sweater, she hands it back to me, and she hugged me. 
And then we walked to the outer door. And she said goodbye to Pat, and she hugged me a second time. And then we left. Now, the man who brought us down was taking us back up. And he said to me, you know, you're very lucky she did this. She doesn't, she's not ever photographed out of costume or character, and this is very important. And I said, why did she do it? He said, because her son told her you were all right. My first shoot in London was with Chris Larkin. And I never gave it a second thought, but he called his mom and said, this dude's okay, and I got the shoot with Dame Maggie. And I've never seen him again, but in my heart, he is my friend. <laughs> By the way, every celebrity that's in the book got a kill sheet so they could tell me which pictures they didn't want me to use. Dame Maggie sent it back with a note that said, use whatever you want, I trust you. Yes. 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 Now we are stopped. I think it's time for you to formally meet my beautiful friends up here. Yes. yes. So you guys already know Jane Houston, right? Basically, what Don does is try to follow my back phrasing. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you guys something. This is the truth. Many, many times over the years, people have said to me, You're such a bad singer. <laughs> You're such a bad singer. I have been singing with this one for 32 years. <laughs> Not once has he ever made me feel like it was anything but a beautiful singer. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I want to really make noise for Ricky Pope. Do you want to sing with me? Sure, sure, I'd love to. Do you want to sing something from starting here, starting now? I think the world is ready for my version of I think I may want to remember today. <laughs> do you want to sing the song we rehearsed? That looks too bad. You're so snarky. Do you I like? So let me tip my hat. In your path, I'll spread my welcome mat. You I like, and you imagine that. Although your ways may be strange, and there's much that I change somehow. You I like, and warmly recommend. From now on, I'll call each other friends. You I like, and I forgot the words. Can you believe? Such a thrill in the sound of the new chord we strike. You I like. I'll pick them up, they're the same word. <laughs> you I like. So let me tip my hat. In your path, I spread my welcome mat. You I like. Can you imagine that? Although your ways may Somehow, you I like and warmly recommend. From now on, we'll call each other friends. I'll be at your side until the end. Can you believe that I found such a thrill in the sound of the news? Lord, we strike. Friend. I'll be at your 
side until the end. Can you believe that I found such a thrill in the sound of the new chord we strike? You at 16th Street and worked our way down to 14th. Yeah. And back up to 16th <laughs> The entire distance on this cold, sunny winter day, we saw these young college-age students with signs that said, free hugs. It was charming. We didn't, we, 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 we didn't get a hug. We didn't get a hug. But it was charming. And we sat down at a park bench at the top of the park and we were so moved by the charm, I thought it was just the right time for me to get up and get down on more knees. Watch those road signs, they'll indicate a bit of Johnny, which a direction to go. Rely on time and time. Face the fact you're no brando, rod and handle. You speak low, Johnny, tip tone, Johnny. Go slow, Johnny, go slow. No sooner had he said yes than we heard a scream. <laughs> And we look up towards 16th Street and we see one of the free hugs girls racing toward us saying, Oh my God, did you guys just get engaged? And she vaulted herself into our arms. Her friends followed suit and we were enveloped by youth. And we got to talking and they told us that they were NYU students, each of them a Californian. And when their home state developed the deplorable Proposition 8, they started the Free Hugs Movement to show that there are Californians with love in their hearts. It was a perfect moment. And there was one boy, very, very tall, and he hugged Pat, not under the arms, but over the shoulders like this. And he said to Pat, just say when. Oh. Go slow. <laughs> Maybe she'll come to her senses if you give 
give her a chance. People's feelings are sensitive plants. Try not to trample the soil and spoil romance. Go slow, Johnny. No sense in rushing your fences till you know that you know. Rely on time and time to face the facts. You're no brando, raw and tando. Speak low, Johnny. Tiptoe, John. Go, oh, 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 slow, Johnny, go slow, oh, oh, go slow, Johnny, go slow. exactly the reason why I had to. It just took me four decades to find my voice and my courage. 
I could not have done this without the generous support of everyone sitting here because you guys have sent me text messages and, and voicemails and uh, Facebook messages. And you guys have made this possible. And the... If I sound good, it's because this man's been coaching me. Oh. Yeah. Michael Buchanan. Yeah. If I look good, it's because Eric's been lighting me today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please tip Max generously. Yeah. So, Brady Schwinn helped me trim away the fat and make sure that nah. I had my eyes open. So. Uh, yeah. While we're stopped, I want to um, I want to address something that's been the subject of much ballyhoo these last few months on Facebook. My retirement. Um, here's the thing: when I was recovering in the hospital, I got to thinking about all the things that I want to do and all the people that I want to spend time with that I don't get to spend time with. And you can't do the things you want to do if you're busy doing the things you've always done. And that's why. I have some new adventures that I need to, some new things that I need to learn. I have a new threshold that I'm on. I have been reinventing myself my entire life. Maybe I have ADD. <laughs> Or maybe I don't want to get to the day that I'm going to die and already have been dead. Where do we go from here? Now that you are standing here with me, after all, there's more to life than holding you. What's gonna happen? I don't know. What's gonna happen? Where do we go from here? In its original context, this song shows a boy and a girl in a photo booth. And they're contemplating the uncertainty of the future. And they're contemplating life and love and relationships and risk and hope all of the things that live inside this tattered, surviving heart of mine. I truly do believe that these relationships are all we have. And as long as we are together, there is hope. Where do we go from here? Now that we are sitting side by side, after all, there's more to life than we can see. Will there be troubles? I don't know. Will there be sweet things? I hope so. Will there be time to keep on dreaming once this dream is over? What happens when the booth goes bright? What happens when you're out of view? What happens when you can't hold tight? Or when I can't hold on to you? What happens when tomorrow comes and there's nothing else that we can do? What's gonna happen? I don't know. 
whatever happens, here we go. What's gonna happen? Where do we go? White, a blank page or canvas. But something amazing has happened, and um, I have to do this encore because my mother is here. Yeah. Both my parents are here, but my daddy seems to have left the room. Is he, is he okay? He's here. He's here? He's here? Okay. Um, my parents are here. I know you guys know how much I love my father, but I know that you guys also know about the, the soulmate relationship that I have with my mother. And so, once it was determined that they were coming, I said, I'm doing the song. Um, because, see, when I was a kid, growing up in Portugal and Switzerland, I would wake up on Saturday mornings to the smell of pancakes and bacon and coffee and Windex. Um, it was house cleaning day, and Mama would open up all of the windows, and she would let in the sunshine, and she would let in the fresh air, and we would <coughs> clean house while listening to her favorite music. The Stones, yes. the Hollies, yes. the Mamas and the Papas, yes. the Carpenters, yes. Carol King, Carly Simon. And there was this one singer who was <clears throat> her favorite, and as a true blue mama's boy, she had to become my favorite too. And this was always tacitly understood to be our song. So this is for my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful mother. Sometimes it feels like you and me against the world when all the others turn their backs and walk away. You can count on me to stay. Remember when the circus came to town and I got frightened by the clown. It was so nice to be around someone that I knew, someone who was big and strong and looking out for me and you against the world. Sometimes it feels like you and me against the world. And for all the times we cried, I always knew that we were on each other's side. And when one of us is gone, and one of us is left to carry on, remembering we'll have to do, the memories alone will get us through. Think about the days of me and you and me against the world. When Married and Counting opened, my mother was the breakout star. <laughs> not the actor, not the clown, my mother. 
there were cheers and shouts and applause and screams when she had her scene in the film. And when we did the screening in Austin, she yes. was there. Yes. Yes. And when we did the talk back, did they want the clown? Did they want the actor? They wanted my mother. <laughs> this made me the happiest of them because I knew then that the wide populace would know what I always know. That this woman, my mother, the best. And when one of us is gone, and one is left alone to carry on, then remembering will have to do. The memories alone will get us through. Think about the days of me and you. the world.